Eve Galair, Lo Ayla Padraig, son of Eve, Ta An Ozer Mavera Rashinsha, Rashigabala Igil Khunig. Welcome to our St. Patrick's Day Festival. In the first part of our show today, we've got a host of talks and workshops to get you excited for the day and to help you go green at home. You'll learn about Irish mythology, how to forage in your local environment, draw St. Patrick and his snakes, and about Noor Vision and all the changes you can make to help make Kilkenny a more sustainable county. We'll even be meeting some real life snakes. This afternoon, we'll be back with our virtual parade that will include music, dance, entertainment and fun. Then at four o'clock, we'll be bringing you a very special concert from Keela in association with Cartoon Saloon, Kilkenny County Council and Culture Ireland. The evening will end with world-class traditional Irish music from some of Ireland's best loved musicians. But right now, it's time to get creative. So grab your pencils and pens and learn to animate like a professional with Gráinne. Be Misha Tharrant. Hi, my name is Grania. Happy St. Patrick's Day. La fe la por con la Dave. Today I'll be doing a tutorial on how to draw St. Patrick. So if you want to grab your pens and pencils, we can get started. So here is the St. Patrick that I designed last week. I'm going to be using a light box here to draw it so that I can focus on showing you how I go about drawing a character. So the best thing to do whenever you're drawing anything is to break down what you're drawing into simple shapes. For example, here, we've got a circle for the head. We've got this boxy shape here for the body. We've got these long rectangles for the legs. We've got circles here, um, spirals, um, these S shapes. So that's the best way to go about beginning a drawing like this. So first off, draw a circle for his head put a cross down the middle so that we can uh, map out his facial features within that shape. Now we're going to start on the body. So if you want to draw a line for his shoulders and attach those two lines to either side of his hips. And now we're going to move on to his legs, which are two long rectangle shapes on either side. Now we're going to move on to his hat. I'm not sure of the technical term for what this is on top of his head, but we're just going to call it a, sh a, a hat for, for now. And we're going to draw in the shape for his uh, beard. And then move on to his long flowing hair. And then we'll put an ear on either side, so two ears. And then we're going to move on to this half circle around his chest, which I was thinking was like the golden twerk from the Bronze Age, uh, but it can be a piece of jewelry, a piece of armor. I always imagined it being gold, but it can be any color, of course. Now we're moving on to the arms and uh, it's good to map these out before you draw them in so you know exactly where they're going. So that's where his elbows will go and then we'll draw another circle for where his hands will go. And then just if you want to draw in the shape of his fingers. And there you have it, we have one forearm down and attached to his upper arm. Then if you want to draw another circle on the other side where his hand will go and then draw in the details for his fingers and his thumbs. And there you have it, we have two arms drawn. Good job. Now we're going to move on to some more details of the armor he's wearing. So if you want to draw on his shoulder pads and his chest plate, and I drew a kind of spiral design at the center of his chest there, but um, you can draw whatever you like.
Now we're going to move on to his staff, drawing his staff. So if you just want to draw two lines to attach um, it from one hand to the other. And then if you want to draw a big circle, um, so it looks like he's drawing or he's holding a big lollipop at first. And then you can work in the spiral design within that circle. A spiral can be kind of tricky to draw, but if you, but this is the, we're drawing, what we're drawing with the pencil is um, the rough drawing, and then we'll go over it in ink, so you can be a little looser with this uh, pencil line, and then you'll get a chance to undo some of the mistakes you've made when we go over it for a second time in the black ink pen. And if you just want to add the two lines there at the bottom, and that's the staff finished. So we're almost there with regards to the big shapes. I'm going to draw a ground plane there for him to stand on and put in um, the shape of his boots or his feet. Now we're going to draw a belt around his waist and add this little skirt. You draw in the details for his fingers. Now when it comes to drawing his face, I would recommend making sure that your pencil is sharpened um, so that you can get some of those clean shapes in there when it comes to those uh, smaller uh, details. I designed the beard and the nose so that I was in the shape of a W or a bow and then you can add his long moustache underneath his nose. Bear with me while my drawing desk falls apart. Now I'm going to draw in the shape of the eyebrows. And then under the eyebrows, you can add in the, his eyes. When it comes to drawing the cross on his hat, once again, it's easiest just to map it out with the smaller shapes um, before putting in the details. Now we draw on the line for his boots and then for his socks. These details that I put in were just details to make the drawing look a little bit more finished but you can draw in whatever details you like like these three lines for armbands or the lines on his knees. Uh, you can uh, fill in those spaces with whatever designs you feel like drawing. So we're at a point here where we're just adding the finishing details to the pencil drawing. The lines in the hair and such. Just making sure that you're happy with the your, with how it's turned out. So that's it for St. Patrick. Now it's time to move on to the snakes. So we move on to the snake tails, which are spiral shapes. And that's one down. And here is the second one. and the third and final tail on that side. Now we'll move on to drawing the snake's heads. 
So they're just coming over his shoulders there. That's one down. And the second one coming over that shape. And draw in their eyes and they're smiling. And the last eye and the line for the neck. So I forgot to draw in the cape there, his flown cape on his back. So make sure to draw that in before you start on the snakes on the other side. So now we'll, draw, we'll get started on the final three snakes. Now moving on to the final snake, and we're nearly ready. So once you finish the last of the snakes, it's time to go over your drawing with the black ink pen. So like I said, this is your chance to undo any of the mistakes you might have made with the pencil drawing. Once you're happy with the pencil drawn, you can uh, move on to inking up your drawing. Make sure that the last of the details have been added um, before you move on. Don't forget to add the eyes of the snakes and the mouths of the snakes. Now it's time to ink over your pencil drawing. So you can do this a lot more carefully than with your pencil drawing. And after you're finished with your ink drawing, you can erase the underline pencil and that way you'll get a nice clean black and white drawing. I chose to ink up some parts in black like his boots and his chest armor and his arms just to add some contrast, but you don't have to do that. You can color your St. Patrick whatever way you like. And um, once again, you can just erase the underlying pencil to make so that you have this nice clean crisp black ink drawing. And that's it, ready to colour. Thank you for watching and have a great St. Patrick's Day. Hello, my name is Caroline Busher. I'm an author, a storyteller and a heritage expert. I would like to take this opportunity to wish you and your families a very happy St. Patrick's Day. Whether you're joining us here in our beautiful country of Ireland or around the world, you are most very welcome. For hundreds and hundreds of years, our ancestors have met around firesides and told stories of ghosts, of fairies, myths and legends of all the stories and heritage and history of our beautiful Ireland. I would like to share a couple of these stories with you today and take you on a storytelling journey throughout time, which I hope you will enjoy. To begin today, I'm going to play an, a song for you on a tin whistle. 
It's called Air and Shore. Now the next story I'm going to tell you all is one of my favourite stories because it's about a brave and fearless girl who went on to become a pirate queen. The pirate queen of Ireland, Gráinne Whale or Grace O'Malley as some people know her. Now in the year 1544 when Grace O'Malley was 14 years old, girls were expected to do lots of things such as they were meant to be good at needlework and produce beautiful pieces of embroidery. They were meant to be seen and not heard. And girls were supposed to know their manners and to be good at all times. Now the hero of our story, Ronya Whale, had different ideas than this. She did not want to sit in a castle writing. She wanted to be out on the ocean sailing the seven seas with her father, Owen O'Malley, who was a sailor. So one day she was doing her needlework like a good girl and her mother was there and she turned to her mother and she said, Mammy, I'm not happy being sat in this castle doing all this needlework. I want to be a sailor. I want to go out on the sea with father the next time he goes traveling to Spain. I want to be there with him. Well, you can only imagine what Gronya's mother thought of this. Oh, Gronya. You can't do such a thing as that. Girls are not meant to be out sailing on the sea. They're meant to be sat at home. You have a beautiful castle here. You should be very happy to sit in it all day. And when you're older, we're going to find you a nice husband to marry. Well, Gronya was absolutely livid. She was so angry at this and she stormed out and she went to see her father. And she banged on his door. Father, let me in, she said. So. Owen O'Malley opened the door of his room and there stood his daughter Gráinne. Gráinne, my love, what is it you want? You seem very angry. Well, father, I am angry, she said, and she stamped her feet on the floor and she was very, very cross. Why? What happened? Well, it's just, father, that when I grow up, I don't want to be sat in the castle and married to some prince. I want to be a sailor. I want to be a pirate queen. I want to sail across the ocean with you. I want to do all these things. Well, her father looked at her in confusion and he said, Gronya, it's a very strange request coming from a girl. Girls aren't meant to do things like this. Well, she said, why ever not, father? So her father, Owen O'Malley, thought for a few minutes and he kind of thought to himself, actually, she's got a very good point. Why shouldn't she be able to come out and sail the seas? So he started to think about it until he had a brainwave. Ah, I know, he said. What is it, father? Why can't I go out and sail with you? Well, he said, the thing is, Gronya, you have the most beautiful long hair. And if you come out sailing with me, your hair will get caught in the ropes. Can you imagine? You would have, you'd be in pain. Your hair would be stuck in the ropes. You wouldn't be able to sail. And you know what? All these sailors are a very rowdy lot. I don't think it would be a suitable place for a young girl. So Gronya said, well, father, I'm going to prove you wrong. And she stormed out of her father's room, back up the stairs in the castle to her own room. And what do you think she did? Yep, you guessed it. She got some scissors or some shears and she cut her hair off. She cut her hair so it was really short into her head. And then she ran into her father and he looked at her. Oh, Grania! And her mother ran in. What has happened? Oh my goodness, Grania, what have you done to your beautiful hair? You look like a hedgehog. Well, Grania folded her arms and she said, no take me on the sea. I'm going to be a sailor whether you like it or not. My hair won't get tangled in the ropes, will it now, father? So her father looked at her and he was dying to laugh, but he couldn't because the queen was so angry, her mother. So she turned to Gronya and she said, okay, let her go with you. And her father was really shocked and he said, 
really, my dear, you think we should bring her? Well, bring her out once, her mother said, and she'll soon get tired of it. She'll see that the sea is no place for a young lady. So Gronio is delighted with this. And off she went on the voyage with her father to Spain. Now, as you could imagine, it wouldn't be very nice to go out on the rough seas and a voyage for anybody, boy or girl in those days. It would have been quite a hard life. However, Gronia took to it like a duck to water. All the sailors really liked her as well because she was, wasn't afraid of hard work. She got her sleeves rolled up and she did all the jobs on the ship. She looked out to see what she could see and she really worked very hard. And also, if anyone got sick on the ship, which happened quite often, Gronia was a really good nurse and cared for them. So they really liked her and she got, gained their respect. So that was wonderful. So after that voyage, it was a huge success. Gronia went out sailing all the time and she used to have taxes so if anybody wanted to come near Clue Bay in County Mayo she would charge them gold to get near her or she'd go out and she'd plunder ships and she'd take the treasures she was a really amazing woman and she became known as Gronia Whale the Pirate Queen of Ireland now there was someone who wasn't very happy with this and this somebody happened to be the Queen of England at the time, it was Queen Elizabeth, and Queen Elizabeth I was not at all happy when she heard about this pirate queen ruling the sea and charging taxes, because at the time, Ireland was ruled by England. So Queen Elizabeth said that she was a rightful queen, and she was not very happy with hearing about Gronia Whale. So Queen Elizabeth summoned in her guards and she said, go and find this woman known as Gronia Whale, the Pirate Queen, and bring her to me. I want to see this woman. Who is she? So the men went out and tried to find Gronia. And Gronia was actually happy because she said, you know what? I think once the Queen meets me and we talk to each other woman to woman, she will understand that I am a strong, fearless woman just like she is. And I want to rule my land where I live. So she decided to go and see Queen Elizabeth. And there was only one major problem, and that was that Gronia couldn't speak a word of English. She spoke her native Irish. And the Queen of England didn't have a word of Irish. So they didn't know what they were going to do. However, when Gronia was a very young girl, she learned to speak Latin, and so did Queen Elizabeth. So they knew they could speak to each other in Latin. So when Gronia arrived in her ship on the shores of the English, um, land, she was greeted by um, somebody who came up to her and they said to her, Queen Elizabeth will see you when you have completed this questionnaire of 18 questions. Queen Elizabeth had put 18 questions together to find out what life was like for a woman in Ireland at the time and to see what the life of the Irish was like. So Gronia was happy enough. She filled out the questionnaire and she was a brave and bold woman and she went in to meet Queen Elizabeth. Now, as you can imagine, the two women would have had a lot to discuss and Queen Elizabeth at first was not at all happy with Gronia Whale. After the meeting, Gronia Whale went back home to Clue Bay in County Mayo and she lived in her own castle and she ruled the waves and nobody would ever stand in her way again. And I think this is a brilliant story because for girls and women living in those days, it would have been a very different world than it is now. And Gronia Wales showed us that we can do whatever we want to. And she was a really great example of someone who lived her life being brave and fearless. I do hope you enjoyed the story of Gronia Whale, the Pirate Queen. Wasn't she amazing? She's such an inspiration, a brave and fearless woman who lived on our shores and I think she's just fantastic. Now Ireland is full of heroes, of legends. Every single village and town in our beautiful country has historical places that you can visit from castles to ancient dolmens to wells, holy wells to fairy rings. There are every single part of our country is steeped in history and we're very, very blessed. Now, I know that many of you can't make it home to Ireland this year due to coronavirus. Maybe you'd like to come home and see your family and your friends and you're not able to. So I'd like to sing you a very special song today. And this song is inspired by that. And it's about a man who dreams of coming home to his native Ireland. And it's a song that I'm sure many of you will know and love. It's called Spencil Hill. So I'm gonna sing you a couple of verses today and I hope you enjoy. 
Last night as I lay dreaming of pleasant days gone by, my mind being bent on rambling to Ireland, I did fly. I stepped on board a vision and I followed with a will till next I came to anchor at the cross at Spencil Hill. It being on the 23rd of June, the day before the fair. When Ireland sons and daughters in crowds assembled there, the young, the old, the brave and the bold, their duty to fulfill. At the parish church in Clooney, a mile from Spencil Hill. I went to see my neighbors, to see what they might say. The old ones were all dead and gone, the young ones turning gray. I met with Taylor Quigley, he's as bold as ever still. He used to mend my bridges when I lived on Spencer. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for joining me today for some songs and stories and traditional Irish tunes to celebrate St. Patrick's Day this year. And happy St. Patrick's Day everybody. I hope to see you again for some more stories and for some songs in the future. Thank you. Bye for now. there and welcome to the National Reptile Zoo. First off, happy St. Paddy's Day to everyone. Hope you're having a great day enjoying yourselves. Hopefully it's very good weather. Um, <laughs> we'll wait to see. Um, my name is Francesca and I'll be doing a short talk with you today um, about the myths of St. Patrick and how snakes came to Ireland and just snakes in general. Um, so first off, the big myth about St. Patrick is that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. And um, this is actually not true. Uh, snakes were never here in the first place, believe it or not, when all the land masses separated. And um, snakes just happened not to end on our um, on our particular little island, just from preferring other countries and other warmer climates. So when it came to St. Patrick, the story of him casting out the snakes is essentially more realistically him casting paganism out of Ireland. So paganism was the belief in numerous gods and he essentially came into Ireland um, from Wales actually, so he's not Irish himself, but he came in from Wales and started promoting this idea of Christianity, of there being one god, but being the part of the the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being part of one. And so what he actually did, rather than casting out paganism, was he actually started to promote Christianity and the idea of one God over new gods. So he didn't cast out snakes, there were never snakes here to begin with. <laughs> when it comes to talking about snakes, um, there's many misconceptions or misunderstandings about snakes. I have a couple of snakes here that I'm going to show you now. And I'm going to talk you through the main aspects of snakes and also some myths that we have about them. Not only because of fears in the country, but just general mis misunderstandings about them. So I'm going to start with a snake called Elvis. I'm going to take him out of this little box I have here now. 
And so Elvis is a California king snake. Now, you'll notice Elvis doesn't have legs, first off. He is just one large um, body. Now, he does have a head. He does have a main body with all his ribs and his organs, and then he does have a tail. However, he doesn't have legs. So this is one big feature about snakes that makes them different from all other reptiles. These guys have actually branched off from lizards who do have legs. So they have some similarities to lizards, but they are their own group of animals. Now, I'm going to change to my close-up camera just so I can show you a little bit of the details on Elvis's head here. So bear with me now when I change cameras. Now, so the big thing about snakes is their sense of smell. People notice they're sticking their tongue out a lot. People think often that when snakes stick their tongue out, they're, they're tasting. What they're doing is actually smelling. They have a very um, special organ in their mouth where they pull their, they stick their tongue out, they actually smell the air and pull in particles of air and taste it on the top of their mouth. And that helps them identify where their food is. Um, looking at our friend Elvis here, most people think he's slimy. So that's a big misconception, a misunderstanding. Snakes are actually not slimy. If I show you lovely up close, you can see he has lots of little scales and these scales are made of keratin. So keratin is the same material that you would have um, your nails made of, your hair made of. And so if you were actually to feed your nail here, that's exactly what Elvis, our friend here, feels like. So Elvis here um, is sniffing around here, and that's one way of finding his prey. But also, snakes are made up of loads and loads of ribs, and that's another way in which they can um, feel vibrations and they can actually hear. Now I'm going to swap from Elvis uh, and I'm going to show you another snake, which is a corn snake. Before I do that though, I will mention about Elvis's name. So Elvis is a California king snake. He, that means that he's one of the snakes that would actually eat other snakes. King, if they have king in the name, it's a common hint that they actually eat other snakes. But Elvis here is not venomous. So we have about three and a half thousand species of snakes in the world. And most people think that they're all venoms. That's in fact not true. It's only about 600 species that in the world that are venomous. So that's about 10% of all snakes in the world are venomous. Elvis is one that is not venomous. Um, and he usually kills by constricting. So he adapts so that he can open his mouth very wide and he, once he bites part of his prey, he wraps around it and tightens and tightens until the, the animal is dead. Um, there are venomous snakes, um, and the venomous snakes, instead of constricting their prey, they tend to inject venom. Um, but again, it very much depends on if you're allergic to certain things in their venom. Um, it depends on how you react. So people may be bitten by venomous snakes and actually most of them will survive because they may have different reactions. But they're definitely not as scary as you think. Even though Elvis here is a king snake and he can kill other snakes, he's smelling me and I'm no threat to him. He's perfectly happy and he's not going to hurt me either. You'd only hurt people if he was under threat. But any any reptile or any animal would, would defend themselves like that under threat. Now, I'm going to put Elvis back and I'm going to show you another friend that we have here, another snake that we have in our care. I am going to clean my hands naturally. We like to clean our hands between each animal like normal. And now I'm going to pick up our friend, corn snake. Now, this is our corn snake, Ozzy. And you can see much different colours to Elvis. So Ozzy is from North America, um, but he's over, over a more general region. So where the California Elvis was found in mostly California, this guy is found all over North America. And so he has adapted this lovely, lovely color here to blend into his environment where he's found. Now, corn snake, big hint there, he's usually found 
in cornfields. And so one thing that snakes love to do is they love to change their colours to adapt to where they're hiding. Because he's found in corn fields and he eats a lot of rodents, he's adapted to have these lovely orange colours that help him camouflage in his environment. The king snake, however, you remember had lovely dark browns and whites. He's going to be found in a lot more woodland kind of um, browner habitats. And so he's adapted to have those colours as well. Now, this corn snake is not venomous again, so he is another guy who would eat food by biting it and constricting around it. Um, a lot of the snakes, even if they're venomous, once they're taken care of, they're not too scary. It's a big thing is that we always like to be background um, to our animals. So we hold them in a way in which they're most comfortable. So you can see here, um, Ozzy is very comfortable in my arms, he's just investigating. But I'm no threat to him. So if I was to attack him or go near him or try and poke him, he's naturally going to attack. Even if he's not venomous, he's going to be quite defensive and he's going to want to get away. So all the time that people encounter snakes and they think they're awfully scary creatures and they're awfully slimy and they're awfully fast, and oh my goodness. Most of the time, if you stay away from them, if you keep a reasonable distance, if you don't um, become any threat to them, they're going to be all right, they're going to stay away from you. And even if you go near them, they're, from, they're, want, they're going to want to hide. They're not going to want to attack you. Most of the time, for even venomous snakes, when they do that final attack, when they inject their venom, that's their last attempt to save themselves. They much, much rather run away. So all the time, they're just being careful, they're being protectors of themselves, you know? Snakes are very, very gentle creatures, especially Ozzy here. Yeah, he's just sniffing around, having a look at me. Absolutely no trouble to me at all. Now, Ozzy, is that right? Now, all snakes, so I said, I mentioned Ozzy eats rodents, but actually all snakes tend to be meat eaters as well. Some of them have adapted um, to, to maybe eat fish and such like that, but we do have a wide variety of snakes in a wide variety of um, environments. There are tree snakes who live up in the trees and have adapted to eating lots of insects and lots of little birds up in the trees because that's what they find where they live. You know, Ozzy here has adapted to eat a lot of rodents because he's found in cornfields and so those are the animals that are most readily available to him. But he's on the ground and they're on the ground and they're the easiest animals for him to find and eat. And then you have sea snakes um, who live in the sea. And so you can imagine they would have adapted to eat a lot of fish or small fish or, you know, um, other small vertebrates. Again, mostly meat, but different types of meat. And so snakes are very adaptable. You have various sizes of snakes even, um, and, 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 and lots of different adaptations and changes that they have. So now I'm going to pop away our friend Ozzy here and I'm going to do one last snake. And um, so say bye to our uh, Ozzy, our corn snake, and we're going to say hello to a royal python now. I'm just going to put Ozzy back here so I'll be off camera for a second. And I'm also going to switch to the larger camera. So once I've taken our friend, um, our last snake out here, I'm just going to switch cameras just for a minute so you get a little bit of a better view of, um, of our, the size of this snake because this is a royal python and her name is Rafiki. Now she's one of the larger snakes that we have so you can see immediately she's quite fatter or not quite fatter, I won't say that, I won't insult her but she's quite, um, she's a little bit larger than the other two snakes. The California king was quite slim, and uh, even our corn snake um, was quite slim. And so they would move a little bit faster normally than, um, than our friend Rafiki here. Rafiki is a royal python, and she's a little bit heavier. And um, usually heavy snakes move a little bit slower, not as a rule but it's common that they move slower because they're so heavy. They find it, they have so much more muscle to move and pull along and they find it heavier to, uh, they find the weight makes them move a little bit slower as they're moving. They also move differently sometimes. Um, if I was to talk about it very simply, we have some snakes that move 
side to side to side to side like this. But in the case of heavier snakes, some of them actually move like caterpillars, peeling themselves off the ground and putting themselves moving forward like that. And um, our friend Rafiki here would be one of those snakes because she's so heavy. It's just an easier way of her moving. Now she's an excellent example of um, showing the head size. So the larger the snake, they often have different shaped heads. And you can tell from her pattern here, our royal python is mostly from Africa and Egypt. So they're called royal pythons because they were mostly um, owned by kings and queens in Egypt back in the day, we believe. Um, and they, you, they, 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 as you can see, perfectly comfortable pets. Color, they have lovely brains and lovely green colors. So they're going to be camouflaging very well. And also they're going to be hiding very well in these warm climates that might be found in Egypt. Because they're going to be living in desert areas. Where we have the corn snake who lives in corn and grain fields in North America. And we have the California king snake who is found in California and desert regions. We have um, this snake, our royal python Rafiki, who lives in very um, arid grasslands and deserts. So you can tell snakes come from all over the place. Um, different woodlands, creeks, uh, rivers, the sea, um, trees. And so there's so many different types of snakes in the world, so many different um, habitats in which they live, so many different types of meat that they eat. But they're so kind. This is the one thing we really want to get across to you, is they're so um, calm and at ease once you're no threat to them. Snakes aren't as scary as people believe because once you're background, once you're not a threat to them, once they've figured out that you're not food and that you're no, not trying to have them as food, they'll be much more comfortable and they'll go on their way and they'll leave you alone and they won't book you and they won't harass you. The big message is that they didn't come from Ireland. Paddy didn't get rid of them. But what ones we do have in the National Reptiles Zoo, we're delighted to have. And they're not nearly as scary as people may believe. So we definitely have a wonderful St. Patrick's Day. From all of us in the National Reptiles Zoo, we hope you have an excellent day. Law Fela Padraig. And definitely come and see our lovely, lovely snakes. Uh, we'd love to show you them up close and personal and they'd be delighted to see you. Not at all as scary as you all believe. I think we'd all agree. All right. So thank you very much for tuning in, guys, and have an excellent pack St. Patrick's Day. All right. Bye from Rafiki, bye from Ozzy, and bye from Elvis. And I hope, hope you have a good day. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi, I'm Mauro from Kilkenny Forest School and today we're out in the woods to find some of the signs of spring. And here is this little nettle just emerging from the forest floor. Nettles are one of our more familiar wild edible foods that can be easily identified by their toothed leaves. Nettles are filled with vitamins and minerals and are a great source of nutrients at this time of year and they can be added to soups or pestos or even just make a tea and we can see some beautiful little primroses just emerging here as well and bringing the promise of spring this is wild garlic or ramsons another edible plant that we find in springtime and you can find this one on the forest floor in a carpet of green you'll smell it before you see it and if you just rub the leaf between your fingers like this break the juices up give it a little smell you know it for sure so i use this for pestos and in salads and soups and it's really a delicious one really great for the blood and what I'm doing here, I'm picking the leaves individually, one by one, from the base of the, of the stalk, making sure to leave the bulb on the ground. 
And when we're foraging for plants, we always just take what we need and pick in an area that's plentiful. So taking one of your big rods and working with the curve of the willow, I'm just going to, between my thumb and forefinger, just prepare the willow. And now taking the rod, working with the curve, I'm going to make one kink to create a fish shaped body. And now with another kink, I'm going to create the tail. Now we're going to begin the weave, coming over one side and under the other side in a figure of eight, weaving it nice and tight over and under. In ancient Ireland, the hazel tree was known as the tree of knowledge. It's really easy to identify the hazel at this time of year by these beautiful catkins which adorn it. It's a vital food source for many mammals in the woods and it was a really essential resource for our ancestors for building and for food. The next time you're out in the woods, why not have a look for hazel and see if you can find the tiny red flower. Have you ever noticed the tiny red flower that appears on the hazel at this time of year? It is said that when you see this red flower, sap is rising in the birch. One of the first things I notice when I arrive in a birch woodland is the crackle of the branches underfoot. birch and the most striking thing about the silver birch is its bark. You can see this beautiful shimmering silver and these horizontal markings that just make it stand out in the woodland. The birch was one of the first trees to start growing after the ice age and you can see here that it grows really well in this wetland. Birch sap is the ultimate spring elixir. It basically tastes like sweet water and it's filled with minerals and vitamins. And it's really easy to gather. The first thing you're going to need is a bottle and some string and secateurs. So I'm going to take my secateurs and I'm just going to make a cut of the branch. And now I'm going to attach the bottle to the twig over that little branch there and tying it on to a branch just above it. Any knot you want, reef knot, anything at all, just as long as it's good and secure. And I'm going to leave it there for a few hours or maybe even a full day. And when I come back, I expect to have a little bottle of birch sap. coming along and joining us today for a walk in our woodland and I hope that you can find some signs of spring in your local woodland.
Hi, my name is Monica. I've been gardening for nature for many years and I'd like to encourage you to garden for nature too. All you need to do if you want to garden for nature is to try to replicate some of the native Irish habitats that we have here in Ireland. Um, a habitat is a home for a, for a creature and a habitat will provide everything that that creature needs. It will provide food and water, space and uh, shelter and, um, and also uh, creatures of its own type that it can make a family with. The Irish countryside evolved over thousands of years to become a mosaic of different kinds of habitats. Uh, woodland, bog, mountain, seashore, sand dunes, meadows, um, wetlands like we have here at New Park Marsh. And um, all, all these different habitats have a, an abundance and a variety of different creatures that live in them. Uh, but in the last about 70 years, the use of the land of Ireland, the man, its management has changed dramatically and very rapidly as well. Farming practices have changed and the spread of towns has meant that um, our, our native wildlife has been squashed into smaller and smaller areas of the habitat that it wants to live in. So some species are in decline because of this loss of habitat and uh, some are actually threatened with extinction. The good news is there are about 2 million gardens in Ireland. So that's a lot of land. It's about 395,000 acres of land, in fact. So if, uh, if we can try and create some habitats in some of that space, it will create um, places for our wildlife to live. One of the easiest habits, habitats to recreate in your garden is a woodland. If you have the space, you can plant um, a variety of native Irish trees. Trees like ash and oak and willow, hazel, holly, birch, rowan. There's many, many species of trees that you can plant. If you don't have much space in your garden, you can choose some of our smaller native trees. Gelder rose and spindle, field maple, mixed in with trees like the birch and alder that are small as well. And these will create a fantastic habitat. To this you can add climbers like um, ivy and old man's beard, which is a type of clematis, honeysuckle. And on the ground be below these um, plants, can, you can have your woodland wildflowers like bluebell and wood anemone, um, lesser celandine, wild garlic, ferns. There's a, a, an endless amount of plants that can flower from early spring right through to late summer. If you feel you've no space at all to create a woodland habitat in your garden, even a pile of logs or some old dead wood or a pile of branches can support a lot of the shade-loving um, creatures that would be in a woodland. Another habitat that's very easy to recreate in your own garden is a wildflower meadow. Um, you can simply leave your lawn or areas of grass to grow long and then investigate if there's a lot of different species coming up there. If after you've let it grow long, there's not a lot of species, you can maybe add some um, wildflower plants or seeds into this meadow. Uh, plants like yellow rattle and oxeye daisy, knapweed, field scabious, there's many and many, many more. If this type of um, situation doesn't work out for you, if the grass is growing too much and there isn't much uh, diversity there, you can start from scratch with bare soil and sow a suitable mix of native Irish wildflower seed to create a really fantastic meadow. Another type of habitat um, is a wetland habitat like we have here at New Park Fen. It's a really, really rich and diverse habitat that takes a bit more work to establish in a garden but can be done. So if you did want to create or try to mimic the wetland habitat, um, you would need, you, you could investigate if you already have wet patches in your garden and simply plant some uh, suitable uh, water loving plants into those areas. Otherwise you would need to dig and uh, put some pond liner down and into that then plant your water loving plants. Many of them are going around here in New Park Fen. There's flag iris and different sedges and rushes. Uh, meadow sweet, um, agrimony, and water, uh, water mint, and water avens, and marsh marigold, which will be coming into flower here soon. There's always a lot of it at the fen. 
So gardening for nature is really easy and it's a really valuable thing to do. I'd encourage you to take a look at your garden. There may already be some habitats there that have value for wildlife. And just uh, try to reduce the amount of mowing and clipping of hedges and using of sprays that you do. When you're gardening for wildlife and for nature, try to um, examine what type of soil and conditions are already in your garden. So if you have a shady garden, maybe, the, maybe you should um, create a woodland in that shady area. If it's wet, create a wetland there. Or if it's really dry and it's, it's hard to grow certain plants in, um, grow and plant uh, plants that love dry ground. They'll thrive there, your garden will look fantastic and um, it'll be a fantastic habitat for all the different wildlife. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, so we all need to change the way we think about our gardens and see the, a wilder garden as a beautiful thing. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. In keeping with the green tradition of St. Patrick's Day and the last number of years where St. the St. Patrick's Day celebration in Kilkenny has been around nature and biodiversity, I think it's only fitting and appropriate that this year the St. Patrick's Day Festival Committee has decided to bring about a celebration of a biodiversity champion for Kilkenny. And I can think of nobody more deserving of the inaugural award of Kilkenny's biodiversity champion than Pat Boyd. I Pat has done incredible work with Keep Kilkenny Beautiful through the work he's been doing on the River Nore with invasive species and all the wonderful awareness that he's been doing with communities, bringing people on board, bringing people together, not just to celebrate biodiversity, but to do something about it and to make sure that we have a very strong force for nature across Kilkenny. Pat has been a really true biodiversity champion. And I think it's something that Kilkenny has done really well over the last number of years in nurturing this whole approach to nature and biodiversity, something that can be replicated throughout the country. And I want to congratulate Pat because I think he's an absolutely worthy and deserving biodiversity champion for Kikeni. I'm very honoured to be awarded the Biodiversity Champion by the St. Patrick's Day Kilkenny Committee. Um, Kilkenny people take great pride in their environment as we have seen when we won the IBAR competition recently for the fifth time and I think now we're going to step up and going forward the new biodiversity plan is an opportunity for us to show that we care for more than just our aesthetic environment but for our natural environment as well and um, I'd like to encourage everybody to get involved in their local community, their local residential committee and get behind the new national pollinator plan that's going to be coming out on March the 25th and um, for everybody to participate in their own gardens and in their own communities and just to, it's a great opportunity to push biodiversity forward. Thank you very much. Rising in the shadow of the Devil's Bit Mountain. For millions of years, the River Nore has flowed southeasterly over its limestone foundations. Meandering past Templemore in County Tipperary, 
Castletown and Douro County Leash. And after leaving Ballyragget, it weaves its way through the heart of Kilkenny City. It then flows through picturesque Bennett's Bridge, Thomastown, and the V-shaped valley of Inistig, before joining her two sisters, the Barrow and the Shore, and flowing out to sea. For thousands of years, we have used the river's power and strength to sustain our people. Breweries, sawmills, woolen mills, marble works and grain mills all thrived on the banks of the rivers. The Nore and her tributaries have also been at the heart of our ancestors' culture and heritage for millennia. Nowadays, the river and her diverse catchment provide food for our table, homes to our wildlife, and endless opportunities for sports and recreation for our people. It's never been more important that we as communities work together to collaborate, to celebrate, and to activate ourselves around our biodiversity and nature. And Norvision has been doing that for many years now. The beauty of what has been created with Norvision is a community of people who have the best interests of the river and its catchment at the core. Today, the Nor catchment, along with its many tributaries, is a source of drinking water, flood control, biodiversity, food production, recreation, and life for some 110,000 people. We need to better understand the value of our natural surroundings, the inspiration it gives us, and the quality food it puts on our table. Embracing nature and biodiversity individually, we can do a little, but together we can achieve so much more to protect and enhance our environment. No Vision is here to support those who wish to protect and enhance this beautiful and valuable resource by rolling up their sleeves and getting involved. From April 26th to 28th, Norvision will hold a free online conference for everyone to come together to learn how we can protect our river and our environments. To leave a legacy for future generations. One native Irish tree will be planted for everyone who joins the conversation. Details available at www.norvision.ie slash conference. Mila Builchus, the Gokaina of Elin Air Modern. I've learned so much already today and I can't wait to get out and put my new skills and knowledge to the test. Thank you to all our contributors. With your help, Kilkenny will be green in no time. We're going to take a little break now, but there's still lots more to come today. First up, we'll have our virtual parade with music and dance performance. Then later at four o'clock, we have our very special Keela and Cartoon Saloon concert. Finally, tonight we round off our festival with an evening of traditional music. So join me back here as we continue the celebrations throughout the day. Kilchunigaboo.